You're listening to the Intrepid Radio Program with Scotty Roberts. Intelligent Talk. Happy Wednesday evening, folks. This is Scotty Roberts. You're listening to my show, the Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y-S-Y-1 dot com. And uh, if you're joining us in the video simulcast over on my YouTube channel, you can also be joining the live chat room, which is going on right now during this show. That's over at YouTube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. And by the way, for those of you watching, it looks like I have this huge, manically large microphone, but uh, it's all the camera and stuff. See, because if I come right up on top of the mic... That's about how it is, right there. So it's not as huge and large as it looks. It's all illusion, folks. So uh, I keep it down here out of my face, uh, lest because of the uh, the uh, the camera lens just distorts everything. So uh, and I'm actually much more muscular than I appear on camera because of camera distortion. Well, anyway, let's move on. So welcome to the show tonight. Uh, I took last night off. It was more a thing of having so much going on yesterday that uh, I got pulled in a million different directions, and I just uh, had to cut something out yesterday, and it ended up being the radio show. So thanks for bearing with my absence for Tuesday night, uh, but we're back tonight, hopefully in full force with some good material. I'm working on lots of other things, by the way. Uh, for future shows, and maybe some shows will plunk in the middle of of uh, breaking up uh, all of our uh, episodes in this series on Native America. But I do think that this is important history for us to review and things to learn, things to know that perhaps we didn't know before. Um, and this is all a response, really, when D. Brown wrote his book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, It was all in a response to the victors write the history. And so he wanted to give the history of the taking of the American West, the conquering of the American West, the winning of the American West, whatever you want to refer to it as, from those who lost that battle. And uh, that's what this series has been all about. And so I hope that you're not just enjoying it from an educational or an edutainment type of factor, but also that you're learning things and pulling some information out. And uh, tonight, we're going from the series that we ended, the mini-series within this series, on the Black Hills and on Sitting Bull, which, by the way, there's more to his story, which we'll hit later. Uh, But Sitting Bull, uh, Crazy Horse, the Plains Sioux Indians, the fight over the Black Hills, we're now kind of kind of segue and move to a different part of the country, and we're going to talk about the Nez Perce, is the way it's pronounced. I always say Nez Perce because it's got that accent point, and I think almost French, like French trappers that uh, came up with that name, but it's the Nez Perce, and uh, they're in the northwest of what is now the United States. And uh, we're going to look at uh, the battle that went on not in the, the series of battles, the flight of the Nez Perce. And uh, let's start, like we do with all these sections, on some of the history that was going on during that time. In 1877, now, this is about six to seven months after the Battle of the Little Bighorn, uh, Custer's Last Stand, and the final driving of the Sioux off the plains and out of the Black Hills and into reservations. In 1877, January 1st, Queen Victoria, this this puts it in uh, perspective for you, that's when a lot of this was going on, Queen Victoria was proclaimed the Empress of India. On uh, January 25th of 1877, the U.S. Congress passed Electoral Commission Bill that requires recounts of electoral votes. Hayes-Tilden contest was still in doubt at this time uh, for the presidency. Uh, February 12th, railroad workers begin to strike in protest over wage cuts. Now, the striking, look at the striking. It's in 1877. Didn't they just build the railroad, railroads 10 years earlier, and they were already striking? So uh, there's some financial problems that are going on in the railroads. 
February 26th of 1877, the Southern Democrats meet secretly with Hayes' Republican representatives and conclude the Compromise of 1877, in which Southern Democrats agreed to support Republicans in exchange for withdrawal of federal troops from the South and ending of the Reconstruction after the Civil War. This is 10 years after the 11 years after the end of the Civil War. February 27th, the Electoral Commission declares a recount in favor of President Hayes. And on March 2nd, the Congress confirms the election of Hayes. March 5th, Hayes is inaugurated as president. April 10th, President Hayes begins withdrawal of federal troops from the southern states, the, Missouri, the, the, uh, um, the Compromise of 1877, uh, as he had uh, arranged prior to the election. And uh, he, this signaled the end of the Reconstruction era in the South. April 15th, the first business telephone was installed in Boston and Somerville, Massachusetts. So that was April 15th of 1877. The first business telephone is installed. And uh, I'll bet you within a week they were already getting calls talking about their car insurance. Uh, moving on. Uh, July 14th, general strikes halt the movement of the railroad trains. July 20th, a strike riot spreads across the United States. And the 21st to the 27th of July, troops battle the railroad workers and force an end to a nationwide strike. They brought out the army, the military. On October 17th, a contract between Pennsylvania Railroad and Standard Oil Company strengthens the oil transportation monopoly. And in December of 1877, Thomas Edison invents the phonograph. Tolstoy's Anna Karenina is, pu Karenina is published in the same year. And I'll, I'll bet you Edison stole that copyright from somebody else. That was his thing. He was the great money usurper of other people's inventions. And then we have a couple of quotes for you here from the same time period. The whites told only one side, told it to please themselves, told much that is not true, only his own best deeds, only the, own, only the worst deeds of the Indians, has the white man told. And that's a quote from Yellow Wolf of the Nez Perce. The earth was created by the assistance of the sun, and it should be left as it was. The country was made without lines of demarcation, and it is no man's business to divide it up. I see the whites all over the country gaining wealth, and see their desire to give us lands which are worthless. The earth and myself are of one mind. <clears throat> the measure of the land and the measure of our bodies are the same. Say to us, if you can say it, that you were sent by the creative power to talk to us. Perhaps you think the Creator sent you here to dispose of us as you see fit. If I thought that you were sent by the Creator, I might be induced to think you had a right to dispose of me. Do not misunderstand me, but understand me fully with reference to my affection for the land. I never said the land was mine to do with as I chose. The one who has the right to dispose of it is the one who has created it. I claim a right to live on my land, and accord you the privilege to live on yours. And this was Hanmat Tuyalakat, and this is Chief Joseph of the Nez Perce, or the Nez Perce. And so, in September of 1805, going back about 70 years, was when Lewis and Clark came down off the Rockies on their westward journey, and the entire exploring party was half famished and ill with dysentery. They were too weak to defend themselves. They'd been on this expedition for almost two years. And they were in the country of the Nez Perce, also named by the French trappers. That's where I got the accent sign, the Nez Perce. And uh, the French trappers had observed some of these Indians wearing uh, dentalium shells in their noses. 
And had the Nez Perce chosen to do so, they could have put an end to the Lewis and Clark expedition there on the banks of the Clearwater River. They could have seized the wealth of their horses. So instead, what did the Nez Perce do? They welcomed the white Americans, supplied them with food, looked after the explorers' horses for several months, while they continued by canoe to the Pacific shore. Thus began a long friendship between the Nez Perce and white Americans. They helped us. Think of uh, um, Squanto and the, and the pilgrims, the, the colonies. It was, it was at the uh, uh, Jamestown colony. They all would have died of, died of starvation had it not been for the Native Americans who came to help them. Same thing here with the Lewis and Clark expedition. Uh, they would have been... I was just looking to see if I had my uh, Lewis and Clark action figures sitting nearby, and I must uh, they must have been moved out of the office here. Uh, my Lewis and Clark action figures, I showed those off one time. Very detailed. I haven't even taken them out of the boxes. A friend of mine who was a Lewis and Clark enthusiast and had a little money to work with, he made these uh, action figures up of Lewis, Clark... Uh, uh, Sacagawea, or Sacagawea, however you want to pronounce it, and uh, all the accoutrements. You fold out the box, had all their belongings, all their rifles, guns, papers. Now, he put great detail into this thing. I was just going to show that, but it's no longer right here where it used to be within reach, uh, up on top of the shelf. <clears throat> anyway, moving on, uh, this great friendship developed, and it carried on a long friendship between the Nez Perce and the Whites. And for 70 years, the tribe boasted that no Nez Perce had ever killed a white man. But white men's greed for land and gold finally broke up that friendship after 70 years. In 1855, Governor Isaac Stevens of Washington Territory invited the Nez Perce to a peace council. Now we're talking Northwest Washington, Washington State. It's not a state yet, it's a territory. Um, he said there were a great many white people in the country and many more would come, that he wanted the land marked out so that the Indians and the white men could be separated. If they were to live in peace, it was necessary, he said, that the Indians should have a country set apart for them, and in that country they must stay. This was Tukakas, a chief known as Old Joseph, by the white men, told Governor Stevens that no man owned any part of the earth, and a man could not sell what he did not own. It makes you think of the, 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 the kind of sappy, very bad, historically rendered, uh, animated film uh, Pocahontas by Disney, and that song, The Colors of the Wind, you think you own whatever land you land on. The earth is just a dead thing you can claim, but I know every rock and tree and creature has a life, has a spirit, has a name. I don't know why I remember that. Well, yes, I do. You know why I remember those lyrics? Because my older daughters, who are now 28, my twin daughters, when they were kids is when that movie came out. I think we watched that or heard it playing in the house hundreds of times. So the words of that song were in my mind. But that's the truth that was in that song, that little snippet of truth uh, in a Disney movie that was so historically blown to pieces. Um, and, uh, and it was uh, uh, old Joseph, the chief, that told Governor Stevens that no man owned any part of the earth. A man couldn't sell what he did not own. The governor could not comprehend such an attitude. It was beyond his com comprehension. He urged old Joseph to sign the treaty and receive presents of blankets for his land. Take away your paper, the chief replied. I will not touch it with my hand. Now, Alea, who was called lawyer by the white men, signed the treaty. And so did several other Nez Perce. But old Joseph took his people back to their home in the Walawa, the Lawawa, Walawa, the Walawa, the Walawa, Walawa, W-A-L-L-O-W-A, Walawa Valley, a green country of winding waters, wide meadows, mountain forests, and a clear blue lake. If you've ever been to the, the Pacific Northwest in the United States, you know the kind of land this is. Old Joseph's band of Nez Perce raised fine horses and cattle. They lived in fine lodges 
and when they needed anything from the white men, they traded livestock. Now, by setting this stage, this pastoral, beautiful, forested land, beautiful plains and prairie, not prairies, plains, uh, 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 the, the mountains in the background, the babbling brooks, the clean streams, uh, a place of peace, horses, cattle, they lived in fine lodges, all of that, historically speaking, you already know by this whole series, is a foreboding of tragedy. Now, only a few years after the first treaty signing, the government men starts, were swarming around the Nez Perces again. They wanted more land. Old Joseph warned his people to take no presents from them, not even one blanket. After a while, he said, they will claim that you have accepted pay for your country, even if you accept so much as one blanket from them. And uh, um, what's interesting, this is uh, out of a book. Uh, it's an Indian's views of Indian affairs. And it was written in 1879 in the North American Review by none other than Chief Joseph. And uh, so in 1863, now remember that date, as that's a date we've covered already. We're going back with all of these scenarios. We're going back over the, the 20 years that we've already covered and all the things going on at the same time. So in 1863, a new treaty was presented to the Nez Perce, and it took away the Wallowa, the, the, the Wallowa, I have a hard time saying that, I feel like I'm walling my wedos, uh, the Wallowa Valley and three-fourths of the remainder of their land. That's what this treaty did. It took away the Wallowa Valley and three-quarters of all they had, and it left them with only a small reservation in what's now Idaho. Uh, old Joseph refused to attend the treaty signing, but lawyer and several other chiefs, none of whom had ever lived in the Valley of the Winding Waters, signed away their people's lands. The Thief Treaty, Old Joseph referred to it as. And he was so offended that he tore up a Bible a white missionary had given him to convert him to Christianity. So to let the white men know he still claimed the Wallowa Valley, he planted poles all around the boundaries of the land where his people lived, something they had never had to do before. Now, not long after that, old Joseph died in 1871, and the chieftainship of the band passed to his son, Heinmut Tuyalakit, 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 T-O-O-Y-A-L-A-K-E-T is the way to spell that phonetically. So, Heinmut it sounds almost German, but it's not. Uh, Heinmut Tu Yalakit, young Joseph, who was then about 30 years old. and This is in 1871. And when the government officials came to order the Nez Perce to leave the Wallowa Valley and to go to Lapwai Reservation, young Joseph flatly refused to listen to them. He said, neither lawyer, uh, the, the one chief named lawyer, in, uh, in English, nor any other chief had authority to sell this land, he said. It has always belonged to my people. It came unclouded to them from our fathers, and we will defend this land as long as a drop of Indian blood warms the hearts of our men. Now he petitioned the great father, Ulysses Grant, at the time we've gone back into Grant's administration, to let his people stay where they had always lived. And on June 16th of 1873, the president issued an executive order withdrawing Wallowa Valley from the settlement by white men. He did this by executive order. He respected uh, uh, Chief Joseph's request. So in a short time, a group of commissioners arrived to begin organization of a new Indian agency in the valley. One of them mentioned the advantages of schools for Joseph's people. Joseph replied that the Nez Perce did not want the white man's school. Well, we've lived for a very long time without the white man's school. Thank you very much. Why do you not want schools, the commissioner asked. And he said, they'll teach us to have churches, Joseph answered. Do you not want churches, the commissioner asked. No, we don't want churches. Why do you not want churches, he's asked. They will teach us to quarrel about God. Joseph said, 
We do not want to learn that. We may quarrel with men sometimes about things on this earth, but we never, never quarrel about God. We don't want to learn that. <laughs> How true a statement is that? And this was all these quotes from him about quarreling about God and not wanting churches all part of the U.S. Commissioner of Indian Affairs annual report in 1873. Page 527, if you ever want to go find that and look it up. So, meanwhile, white settlers were already encroaching upon the Wallowa Valley, which President Grant, by executive order, had said is excluded from the reservation, uh, the, the uh, land commission treaties. And they started encroaching upon it with their eyes on the Nez Perce land. Gold was found in nearby mountains. The gold seekers stole the Indians' horses, and stockmen stole their cattle, branding them so the Indians couldn't claim them back. White politicians journeyed to Washington, telling lies about the Nez Perce. They charged the Indians with being a threat to the peace and with stealing the settlers' livestock, which what they were doing was stealing their own property back. This was the reverse of the truth, but as Joseph said, Quote, we had no friend who would plead our cause before the law council. And two years after the Great Father promised the Wallowa Valley to Joseph's people forever, he issued a new proclamation, reopening the valley to white settlement. The Nez Perce were again given a reasonable time, quote-unquote, to move to the Lapwai Reservation. Joseph had no intention of giving up the valley of his fathers. But in 1877, the governor sent one-armed soldier chief General Howard, remember him, to clear all Nez Perce out of the Wallowa area. So, all of a sudden, the president's executive order is now rescinded uh, by a new president. And so in the four years that had passed since Oliver Otis Howard treated Cochise and the Apaches with justice, he had learned that the army was not tolerant of Indian lovers. He came now to the Northwest Country, determined to restore his standing with the military by carrying out his orders swiftly into the letter. Privately, he told trusted friends that it's a great mistake to take from Joseph and his band of Nesbursa, Indians from that valley. But in May 1877, he summoned Joseph, Chief Joseph, to the Lapwai for a council, which was to set the date they must surrender their land to the whites and the United States. So to accompany him to Lapwai, Joseph chose White Bird, Looking Glass, his brother Olakat, and the Wallowa prophet Tuhulhul, get this name, Tuhulhulzot. The prophet was a tall, thick-necked, very ugly Indian with a gift for eloquent rebuttal. A fugitive from hell, quote-unquote, was the way one man described him. And at the opening of the council, which was held in a building across from the Fort Lapai guardhouse, Joseph presented to Hulhulzot as spokesman for the Wallowa Nez Perce. And uh, we're going to stop there for the end of this first half. we got to go out to break. we got to give... Uh, the radio network a chance to run their ads for this show and uh, we'll be back in just a couple of minutes so you all sit tight we'll be right back
Okay, folks, thanks for sitting on through that break. Thanks for being here tonight. I appreciate that you would take your time to come and listen to me talk. And thanks for being here. And I hope it's efficacious for you that you're learning some good things and experiencing something maybe you hadn't heard before. And so you are listening to me, by the way, Scotty Roberts, on the Intrepid Radio Program, right here on the Odyssey Radio Network. That's O-D-Y. SY1.com, if you don't know where you are. And also, you can come and watch the video simulcast, which isn't much other than watching me talk on camera against a beautiful background. Um, uh, and now and then, I show you some pictures. We'll probably, we might show a picture of Chief, Chief Joseph tonight. We'll see if we get to that. But other than that, it's to listen to me. But the best part about the uh, YouTube channel is the live chat room that's going on right now. Come on over and join us. That's at youtube.com slash Mr. Scotty Roberts. Now, we were talking about this uh, um, council that's set up at the Lapuai uh, Reservation uh, as a date that they have to surrender their land, uh, May 1877, and Chief Joseph is called. Joseph brings along, uh, uh, what the heck was his name? Tuhulhulzot. It could be Tuhulhulzote. Uh, he was uh, um, their prophet. And it was held in a building across from the Fort Lapai guardhouse. So here, come on over to surrender your lands and sign this treaty. We're going to hold this little council meeting right across the uh, dirt road here from the guardhouse. So Joseph presented to Huluhozo. To Hulhu Zote. I can't get the syllables correct to pronounce that smoothly. To Hulhu Zote, as spokesman for the Wallowa Nez Perce. He said, Part of the Nez Perce gave up their land. We never did. The earth is part of our body, and we never gave up the earth. You know very well that the government has set apart a reservation and that the Indians must go to it, Howard declared. What person presented to divide the land and put it up, put us on it? To Hulu Zote demanded. I am the man. I stand here for the president. Howard was beginning to lose his temper. My orders are plain and they will be executed. Now the prophet continued prodding the one-armed soldier chief, asking him how the land could belong to white men if it had come down to the Nez Perce from their fathers. We came from the earth. And our bodies must go back to the earth, our mother, he said. I don't want to offend your religion, Howard replied testily. But you have to talk about practicable things. Twenty times over, I hear that the earth is your mother and about chieftainship from the earth. I want to hear it no more, but come to business at once. Who can tell me what I must do in my own country, to Hulhu Zote retorted. And by the way, this whole exchange is uh, part of, uh, um, hold on, just calling up my footnote here on this. This is part of the U.S. Secretary of War Annual Report in 1877. It's uh, um, Lucullus McWhorter versus Yellow Wolf, his own story. Uh, or he wrote this, Yellow Wolf, his own story. And this was uh, from Caldwell, Idaho in 1940 that this was written. And keep in mind, 1940, that's just before we entered World War II. Um, and by the way, I almost said World War I, so you could discount everything about my personality like they do for Trump because he said World War II when he's meant to say World War I. That's why I paused on that for a second. But uh, this is 1940. This is only 62, 63 years after this was happening in 1940 when this was written. So... <coughs> this goes on. The argument continued until Howard felt he must demonstrate his power. He ordered the prophet arrested and taken to the guardhouse. Then he bluntly informed Joseph that the Nez Perce had 30 days in which to move from the Wallowa Valley to the Lapai, Re Lapai Reservation. Now keep in mind, the prophet's argument was, how can you be telling us to surrender and move off of this land when the land doesn't belong to you? It's always been ours. When did you get possession of this land? And, of course, uh, Howard wasn't taking... I'm sure he saw and understood that contradiction. 
but uh, he wasn't going to, to deal with that at all. My people have always been friends of the white men, Chief Joseph said. Why are you in such a hurry? I cannot get ready to move my whole tribe in 30 days. Our stock is scattered and Snake River is very high. Let us wait until fall, then the river will be low. Well, Howard responded, if you let the time run over one day, he said this very harshly, the soldiers will be there to drive you onto the reservation, and all your cattle and horses outside the reservation at that time will fall into the hands of the white men. Now, Chief Joseph really understood. He knew he didn't have much alternative. So to defend the valley with less than a 100 warriors was absolutely impossible against the United States Army. So when he and his sub-chiefs returned home, they found soldiers already there. They held a council and decided to gather their stock immediately for the move to Lapwai. The white men were many, and we could not hold our own with them. We were like deer, they were like grizzly bears. We had a small country, their country was large. We were contented to let things remain as the Great Spirit made them. They were not and would not change the rivers and the mountains if they did not suit them. So even before they started the long march, some of the warriors began talking of war rather than be driven like dogs from the land they were born. To Huluzote, he released from prison, declared that blood alone would wash out the disgrace of the one-armed soldier chief that the one-armed soldier chief had put on them. Joseph, however, continued to counsel peace. To meet General Howard's deadline, they had to leave much of their livestock in the valley, and when they came to Snake River, the stream was swirling with melted snow from the mountains. Miraculously, they got their women and children across on buffalo hide rafts without serious accident, but while they were engaged in this task, a party of white men came and stole some of their cattle from the waiting herd. Then when they hurriedly tried to swim their livestock across the river, and many animals were lost to the swift flowing current. They couldn't just goddamn well let them wait until fall, could they? A few months to move their whole lives. When the rivers would be flowing low? No, they couldn't give them that time. And so, more embittered than ever, Chief Joseph demanded, or the chiefs, the other chiefs of the Nez Perce, demanded that Joseph halt the march in Rocky Canyon, and hold a council. To Hulhuzote, White Bird, and Olakat spoke for war. Joseph told them it was better to live at peace than to begin a war and lie, and, and lie dead. The others called him a coward, but he refused to back down. While they were camped in the canyon, a small band of warriors slipped, slipped away one night, and when they returned, the Nez Perce could no longer claim that they had never killed a white man. The warriors had killed eleven in revenge for the theft of their stock and for being driven away from their valley. Now, I've said this before. Look at what is precipitating. Did these warriors do something they shouldn't have done? Yes. Did they go against the advice of their chief? Yes. The counsel of their prophet? Yes. They didn't want peace. They wanted to fight to save what they had. And they started taking white lives. You know what this did? Changes the whole complexion of everything. So like many another peace-loving Indian, Chief Joseph was now trapped between the pressures of the white men and the fury of his desperate people. He chose to stay with his people. I would have given my own life, he said, if I could have undergone the killing of white men, uh, the killing of white men by my people. I blame my young men and I blame the white men. I would have taken my people to the buffalo country, Montana, without fighting if possible. We moved over to Whitebird Creek, 16 miles away, and there encamped, intending to collect our stock before leaving, but the soldiers attacked us, and the first battle was fought. And this was in retaliation, by the way, to the killing of the 11 whites. Now, although outnumbered two to one, the Nez Perce drew Howard's soldiers into a trap at Whitebird Canyon on June 17th, and turning the attacker's flank, 
killing a third of them and routing the remainder. Ten days later, the one-armed soldier chief brought up heavy reinforcements to do battle again, but the Nez Perce had slipped away across the mountains. In a succession of shrewd military actions, Chief Joseph outmaneuvered the pursuing soldiers, severely punished an advanced detachment, and then raced to the clear water where Chief Looking Glass was waiting with more warriors. Now, the combined force of the Nez Perce now numbered about 250 warriors with 450 non-combatants, their baggage, and 2,000 horses. And at Whitebird Canyon, they had captured several rifles and a good supply of ammunition. So after withdrawing beyond, beyond the Clearwater, where their fathers had welcomed Lewis and Clark as the forerunners of white civilization 70 years earlier, Joseph called a council of the chiefs. They all knew they could never return to the Valley of Winding Waters or go without punishment to Lapwai. Only one course was left to them, fight to Canada. Sitting Bull of the Sioux had fled to the grandmother's land, and the American soldiers dared not go there to kill him. If the Nez Perce could reach the Lolo Trail and cross the Bitterroot Mountains, they might be able to escape to Canada. Because they were accustomed to crossing the bitter roots to hunt in Montana, the Nez Perce quickly outdistanced Howard's baggage-laden army, and on July 25th they were filing down the canyon near the mouth of the Lolo Creek when their scouts sighted soldiers ahead of them. The Bluecoats were constructing a log barricade at a narrow place in the pass. Under a white flag, Joseph, Looking Glass, and White Bird rode down to the barricade, dismounted very calmly, and shook hands with the commanding officer, Captain Charles Ron. The chiefs noted that there were about 200 soldiers in the camp. We're going by you without fighting, if you will let us, Joseph said to the captain, but we're going by you anyhow, either way. You want to give us a fight, he's saying, we'll fight. Ron told Joseph they could pass only if they gave up their arms. What the fuck is with this, you know? It's not so incredulous because it's history. We already know this happened. But every time you see this, you say, what the hell? What is it that a tyrant or a tyrannical regime will do? They will try to disarm the people first. Okay, yeah, you can go by peacefully. But you have to leave all your weapons here. And Whiteberg replied to this piece of ridiculousness from Ron. He replied that their warriors would never leave their weapons. So knowing that General Howard was approaching from the west, and that another large force under Colonel John Gibbon was marching from the east, Captain Ron decided to stall for time. He suggested that they meet again the next day to discuss arrangements for passage. To this all the chiefs agreed, but after two more days of fruitless parleying, the Nez Perce leaders decided they would wait no longer. So early on the morning of July 28th, Looking Glass moved the warriors into a screening line among the trees in the upper slope of the canyon. At the same time, Joseph led the non-combatants and livestock up the gulch, climbed up to the top of the mountain, and was well around the canyon barricade before the Captain Ron discovered what the Nez Perce were doing. The captain went in pursuit of the Indians, but after a few skirmishes with Joseph's rearguard warriors, he decided not to risk a real fight, and he returned to his now useless barricade. So believing that they had escaped from Howard and, the unaware, and unaware of Gibbon's approaching army, the chiefs decided to move south to the familiar hunting country, of the big hole. There they could rest their ponies and hunt wild game. If the white men could leave them alone, perhaps they would not have to go to the grandmother's land and join Sitting Bull after all. And so on the night of August 9th, the one who limps, Colonel Gibbon, brought up a mixed column of local volunteers and mounted infantrymen and concealed them on a hillside overlooking the Nez Perce camp on the big hole river. As dawn approached, the volunteers asked Gibbon if they should take prisoners during the attack. Gibbon replied that he wanted no Indian 
prisoners, male or female. Now there's families down there, 450 of them. So what did that mean? Kill them all. The night air was cold, and the men warmed themselves by warmed themselves by drinking whiskey. And at first daylight, several were drunk. When Gibbon gave the command to attack, the infantry line began firing volleys and then charged the Nez Perce teepees. Fifteen-year-old Kautol again, Kotolix, Kotolix, K O W T O L I K S was asleep when he heard the, bat the rattle of gunfire. I jumped from my blankets and ran about 30 feet and threw myself on hands and knees and kept going. An old woman, Patsikanmi, uh, came from the teepee and did the same thing, bent down on hands and knees. She was to my left and was shot in the breast. I heard the bullet strike. She said to me, You better not stay here. Be going. I'm shot. Then she died. Of course, I ran for my life and hid in the bushes. The soldiers seemed shooting everywhere, through teepees and wherever they saw Indians. I saw little children killed and men fall before bullets coming like rain. Another teenage boy, Black Eagle, was awakened by bullets passing through his family teepee. In this fright, he ran and jumped into the river, but the water was too cold. He came out and helped save the horses by driving them up a hill and out of sight of the soldiers. The Indians, meanwhile, had recovered from the shock of the surprise attack. While Joseph directed the rescue of the non-combatants, White Bird deployed the warriors for a counterattack. Fight! Shoot them down, he shouted. We can shoot as well as any of these soldiers. By the way, that quote is part of uh, G.D. Uh, G. G. Shields' book, Battle of the Big Hole. It was published uh, in Chicago in 1889. So the marksmanship of the Nez Perce, in fact, was superior to that of Gibbon's mostly drunk and hungover volunteers and soldiers. We now mixed those soldiers badly, Yellow Wolf said. Scared, they ran back across the river. They acted as if drinking. We thought some got killed by being drunk. When the soldiers tried to set up a howitzer, the Nez Perce swarmed over the gun crew, seized the cannon, wrecked it. A warrior fixed his rifle sights on Colonel Gibbon and made him the one who limps twice. <laughs> you gotta love that. They called Colonel Gibbon because he had a limp. They called him the, the one who limped. And, and now he made him the one who limps twice. <laughs> now, by this time, Joseph had the camp in motion. And while a handful of warriors kept Gibbon's soldiers pinned down behind a makeshift barricade of logs and boulders, the Nez Perce resumed flight. They turned southward and away from Canada because they believed it was the only way left to shake off their pursuers. The warriors had killed 30 soldiers and wounded at least 40. Now, you know what that is? That is again a portend of tragedy and disaster to come. You kill 30 and wound 40 of the white soldiers, hell's coming down on them from the United States military. So, in Gibbon's merciless dawn attack, 80 Nez Perce had died. More than two-thirds of them women and children. Their bodies riddled with bullets their heads smashed in by boot heels and gun stocks. The air was heavy with sorrow, Yellow Wolf said. Some soldiers acted with crazy minds. And this was part of McWhorter's uh, report. The Nez Perce rear guard probably could have starved out Gibbon's barricaded soldiers and killed them all, had not General Howard come to the rescue with a fresh force of cavalrymen. Withdrawing hurriedly, the soldiers overtook Joseph to warn him that the one-armed soldier chief was on their trail again. We retreated as rapidly as we could, Joseph said. After six days, General Howard came close to us, and we went out and attacked him and captured nearly all his horses and mules. Actually, 
the captured livestock were mostly mules, but they were pack animals which had been carrying Howard's supplies and ammunition. So leaving the soldiers floundering in their rear, the Indians crossed the Targhee Pass into Yellowstone Park on August 22nd, what is now Yellowstone Park. And they had all of Howard's supplies and ammunition and his mules. Now only five years earlier, the Great Council in Washington, Congress, had made the Yellowstone area into the country's first national park. Okay, it was already a national park. And in that summer of 1877, the first adventuresome American tourists were admiring its national wonders, natural wonders. And among them was none other than the great warrior Sherman, who had come out west on an inspection tour to find out how fewer than 300 Nez Perce warriors, burdened with their women and children, could make fools out of the entire army of the Northwest. When Sherman learned that the fleeing Indians were crossing Yellowstone Park, almost within view of his luxurious camp, he began issuing urgent orders to fort commanders in all directions to put a network of soldiers around these impudent warriors. Nearest at hand was the 7th Cavalry, which had been brought back to strength during the year since Custer led it to disaster at the Little Bighorn a year earlier. Eager to vindicate the regiment's honor by a victory over Indians willing to fight, the 7th Cavalry moved southwestward toward Yellowstone. During the first week in September, Nez Perce scouts and 7th Cavalry scouts sighted each other's columns almost daily. And by clever maneuvering, the Indians shook loose from the 7th Cavalry after a skirmish at Canyon Creek, and they headed north for Canada. They had no way of knowing, of course, that the great warrior Sherman had ordered bear coat miles in a forced march from Fort Keogh on a course that would cut across their path. And so on September 23rd, after fighting rear guard actions almost daily, the Nez Perce forded the Missouri River at Cow Island Landing, and during the next three days, scouts reported no signs of soldiers anywhere. On the 29th, hunters located a small buffalo herd. As they were short of food and ammunition and their horses were badly worn from fast pace, the chiefs decided to camp in the Bear Paw Mountains. Next day, after filling their empty stomachs on buffalo meat, they would try to reach the Canadian border in one more long march. We knew General Howard was more than two suns back on our trail, Yellow Wolf had said. It was nothing hard to keep ahead of him. The next morning, however, two scouts came galloping from the south shouting, Soldiers! Soldiers! And while the camp was preparing to move out, another scout appeared on the distant bluff, waving a blanket signal. Enemies right on us, soon the attack. It was a cavalry charge ordered by Bearcoat Miles whose Indian scouts a few hours earlier had picked up the trail of the Nez Perce. Riding with the charging cavalry were 30 Sioux and Cheyenne scouts who had been brought by the blue, bought by the Bluecoats at Fort Robinson. The young warriors who had turned their backs on their people by putting on soldiers' uniforms, an action which had precipitated the assassination of Crazy Horse. The thunder of six hundred galloping horses made the earth tremble. But Whitebird calmly posted his warriors in front of the camp. As the first wave of pony soldiers swept down upon them, the Nez Perce warriors opened with deadly accurate fire. In a matter of seconds, they killed twenty-four soldiers, wounded forty-two others, and stopped the charge in a wild scramble of plunging horses and unsaddled troopers. We fought at close range, Chief Joseph said, not more than twenty steps apart, and drove the soldiers back upon their main line. Leaving their dead in our hands, we secured their arms and their ammunition. We lost, the first day and night, eighteen men and three women. Among the dead were Joseph's brother, Olokat, and the tough old prophet, Tehulhulzote. When darkness fell on the Nez Perce, they tried to slip away to the north, but Bearcoat had put a cordon of soldiers completely around their camp. 
The warriors spent the night digging entrenchments, expecting another attack at daylight. Instead of attacking, however, Bearcoat sent a messenger out with a white flag. The messenger had brought a demand for Joseph, sent back uh, for, for Joseph to surrender and save the lives of his people. Joseph sent back a reply. He would think about it and let General Miles know his decision soon. Snow had started to fall, and the warriors were hopeful that a blizzard might provide an escape screen to Canada. So later in the day, some of Miles' Sioux scouts rode out under another truce flag. Joseph walked across the battlefield to meet them. They said they believed that General Miles was sincere and really wanted peace. I walked on to General Miles' tent. This is what Chief Joseph said. For the next two days, Joseph was a prisoner, held by Bearcoat in violation of the flag of truce. And during this time, Miles brought up military uh, artillery and resumed the attack. But the Nez Perce warriors held their ground, and Joseph refused to surrender while he was imprisoned by them. On both days, a bitter cold wind flung showers of snow over the battlefield, and on the third day, Joseph's warriors managed to get him free. They captured one of Miles' officers and threatened to kill him unless the general released their chief. That same day, however, General Howard and his lumbering army arrived to reinforce Miles, and Joseph knew that his dwindling band of warriors was doomed. When Miles sent truce messengers to arrange a battlefield council, Joseph went to hear the general's surrender terms. They were simple and direct. Quote, if you will come out and give up your arms, Miles said, I will spare your lives and send you to your reservation. And that uh, was a quote uh, in Chief jo the, the book on Chief Joseph. And returning to his besieged camp, Joseph called his chiefs together for the last time. Looking Glass and Whitebird wanted to fight on, to the death if necessary. They had struggled for 1,300 miles, and they would not quit now. Joseph reluctantly agreed to postpone his decision. That afternoon, in the final skirmish of the four-day siege, a sharpshooter's bullet struck Looking Glass in the left forehead and killed him instantly. On the fifth day, Joseph said, I went to General Miles and gave up my gun. He also made an eloquent surrender speech, which was recorded in the English translation by Lieutenant Charles Erskine Scott Wood, and in time it became the most quoted of all American Indian speeches. And we end on this for tonight. Chief Joseph said, Tell General Howard I know his heart. What he told me before I have in my heart. I am tired of fighting. Our chiefs are killed. Looking Glass is dead. Tehulahuzote is dead. The old men are all dead. It is the young men who say yes or no. He who led on the young men, Olakot, is dead. It is cold. We have no blankets. The little children are freezing to death. My people, some of them, have run away to the hills and have no blankets, no food. No one knows where they are, perhaps freezing to death. I want to have a time to look for my children and see how many of them I can find. Maybe I shall find them among the dead. Hear me, my chiefs. I am tired. My heart is sick and sad. From where the sun now stands, I will fight no more forever. Thanks for being here, folks. See you tomorrow night. Thank you.